Yeah, the, 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 uh, so, yeah, meet the echo room. Oh, I think meet the echo room minute. Yeah, they upload it all the time. So, if I go to this slide, uh, yeah, it's all done by, uh, by meet the echo. No, no.
Can you do this? Yeah, yeah. Next time I'll. Uh, All right. Uh, yeah. Okay. I told people I'd give that. Yeah. An extra five minutes. Of the yeah. Thanks. Larry, uh, we will tell you about your Check sound. Can you hear me for Lorenzo? Can you hear me? Hi, Tobia, can you hear me? Try again. Can you hear me? Yes, okay, I can hear you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Ready to go? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Um, as you know, uh, the, the hackathon, the, the whole thing is a bit of a, a flurry of activity and getting things uh, together quickly. And th that, that goes for uh, our, the way we share the results and the recording of all that. It's kind of always a, a, a test and a, a bit of an experiment. So I think we're all set to go. Thanks for your help in getting the presentations uploaded. And, uh, and we'll go ahead and, and get started. I have a few things just to cover. Um, first of all, j just a reminder, I know some of you weren't here yesterday morning when we started, but uh, um, we do have our, our mask policy. You need to wear a mask. When you're presenting up here, you're free to take it off, uh, take it off as I have now. Um, but when you're at your seat, unless you're eating or drinking, please, please wear your mask and wear it properly uh, just to make everyone else safe and comfortable. We'd appreciate that. Um, a reminder of the note well, uh, the, the presentations you'll be doing here uh, do fall under the note well, just like the work you do within the working group sessions and, and whatnot, so a reminder of that. Um, this is where we are in the agenda. And 
so again, with, with these uh, results presentations, I think it's great that so many of you have put them together and you are doing them. Our, our goal is to be able to, to get through them all relatively quickly. We'll try to keep the uh, things flowing uh, smoothly up here to the best of our abilities. And we really ask that you, you keep your presentation to uh, four minutes at the very, very most. I'll, I'll be running a timer there and I'll let you know when you're down to two minutes, uh, when you're down at one minute, and when your time's up, we're really going to have to cut you off, unfortunately, just, just to leave time for everyone else. Um, so sorry about that, but please uh, you know, try to be brief and know that there's other opportunities, including Hack Demo Happy Hour tomorrow, where you can have much more in-depth conversations with everyone. And uh, with that, uh, oh, one more thing. If you haven't already uploaded your presentation, please upload it into GitHub. W what's happened is behind the scenes, all the presentations you've put there, uh, assuming there's a PDF file, if you were able to get the PDF file there in time, those have all been pulled into Miteco, and we can uh, run through them directly from within Miteco. Um, if you upload a, a, a file afterwards, if you haven't, don't have yours in yet, be sure you convert it to PDF first, then upload it, and we'll do our best to you know, get back to it again uh, at the end. Uh, otherwise, we're just gonna run through the presentations in order. Any questions about that? Okay, um, then I'm gonna turn it over to one of my uh, co-chairs here, Benno, to, uh, to help with running through the presentations. Okay. From top to down, oh, sorry. Hi, welcome. So we're running the presentation from top to down as they appear in the, the Meet Echo. So no, no specific order, maybe first come, first serve. So I would like to invite the first presenter of uh, explicit flow measurements it's in the room. Thank you. So you have four minutes, we will indicate to you one, and then, and, and you're allowed to, if you're in time, you can also ask some questions from the room, but okay. four minutes. Thank you. Left and right, yeah. Okay. Okay, um, my name is Massimo Nilo from Telecom Italia, team. Uh, okay, yes. And, um, this presentation is about the results of uh, explicit for measurements, and um, in, in this particular is uh, related to passive measurements that use the customer traffic. It's not uh, artificial traffic. What we try to understand in this hackathon, if the uh, quick spin bit is uh, supported over internet by the uh, mainly by the OTT or uh, any kind of company web server. And uh, we made an implement, we have already made an implementation of uh, uh, in our open source browser, in this case is Chromium, and uh, with the modification for support of the quick spin bit. Um, here we made some tests uh, over the internet versus the over the top uh, web servers, and uh, mainly they doesn't support this um, spin bit because it's uh, an optional uh, parameter in the standard. Uh, but uh, we uh, made some tests versus an um, open light speed web server that is an open source uh, project. And this is successful. We got the spin bit running. As you can say uh, in the screenshot in the right, uh, by bottom at the right, the spin bit is spinning. And we uh, uh, obtained some delay measurements with uh, a left RTT that is uh, the, from the client side, and on the right RTT, round trip delay, that is uh, related to the, uh, mainly on the internet side. And it's quite um, um, precise, affordable. 
Uh, this is the other uh, thing that we try to uh, investigate in this hackathon. And uh, we try to implement a new delay measurement technique. And uh, this uh, new experimental technique, uh, that is a modification of the spin bit, uh, requires only the, um, the, the modification of the client, uh, of the client side. It relies uh, on um, internal protocol RTT evaluation. We always use, uh, okay, we always use, uh, um, in this case, the uh, quick. And they use uh, the same square wave mechanism that is the, with the alternate marking uh, the, of the spin bit. With some preliminary tests that we done here, uh, we obtain some good results. That is, we can obtain also the delay measurements. And uh, the main goal of this um, uh, implementation of this method, and we can use uh, um, this, this um, uh, alternate technique for the delay measurement only by the modification of the client. And so we don't need any way any, anymore a support by um, the server side. That is, we no, don't, doesn't need to have uh, the, um, the support the support for the reflection bit on the server side. Okay. Okay, this is a screenshot of the user device, and this is the team that is working here. Okay. Thank you. If there is some question, we are here. Okay, no questions, it's good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Excellent. And uh, then next. Right. I don't see a name yet. Yeah? Okay. No? PDMV, PDMV2. <laughs> Who can I invite to come up front? Oh, there you are. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. I'll go through this quick. Okay. How do you do the next? Oh, this one. Yep. Okay, thanks. Oops. Yep, so we're working on three different um, extension header testing uh, uh, things. Uh, two of them we'll present at V6 Ops and one of them uh, at IPPM. We have quite a, uh, quite a crew working on this, uh, uh, a number of students uh, from, um, uh, from India uh, as well who, who are working with us. And so our plan, um, we're trying to do some cloud provider testing at the hackathon, um, decide on the registration protocol that we need for our uh, encrypted PDM. And then we did some uh, presentations with um, eBPF and free router, which the students in India uh, were working on. Essentially, the, the, the point of our project is to figure out if IPv6 extension headers can be used on the internet and we did a presentation uh, at IEPG on them. And we feel that it's really important that extension headers uh, work because it is a very good way that we will have to measure uh, encrypted networks. And uh, what we've been doing is to figure out if they're being blocked exactly where are they being blocked. And we will have a whole side meeting on Thursday, an hour to talk about uh, the, the whole situation. Uh, it seems to us that there's uh, three different topologies involved. Uh, bottom line, if you're doing just client internet server, things seem to work well. If, you're, if you have a CDN provider or uh, if you're in a cloud provider environment, things work less well. And so we need to uh, work together with these people. And uh, the way we're doing our testing is we used eBPF to create a stack which will append uh, an extension header of our choice to each packet 
going in and out of the system. Um, we are also making modifications to free router so that we can put in hop by hop headers and ideally position free routers at various places in the internet so we can see exactly where extension headers might be stopping. Uh, we also did a great deal of discussion of our registration protocol for our encrypted PDM. I'm not going to go through this, <laughs> thank goodness. More breaking news as it happens. Lots going on. Come join us and uh, we'll be happy to talk your ear off. Questions? Yep, great, thank you. Next is the DNS hackathon results. There you go. Yes, so these are the results from the DNS table. Uh, we worked uh, mostly, or there was a big group uh, working on uh, DNS error reporting. So this is uh, the draft which uh, specifies that the uh, builds upon uh, extended DNS errors, but instead of uh, informing the querier about what went wrong, it's uh, informing the operator or the owner of the domain. And it basically uh, works as follows. The authoritative uh, sends a report receiving agent in an eDNS option, which is just a domain name. And the resolver, if it detects an error, uh, sends a query to the uh, reporting receiving agent with uh, the, the, the error. Uh, so Roy Arends, one of the authors of the uh, uh, draft uh, was at our table too, and we uh, gave a lot of feedback. Uh, we discussed that the query type should be text instead of null. Uh, so you could have different TTLs for different errors. And also the error code was moved towards the domain name to uh, uh, facilitate that as well. We thought of a uh, mnemonic for the EDNS option, DRC. DNS error reporting channel, and overall the, the, the draft has better language now. So there's uh, implementation in Unbound, uh, built upon also earlier uh, hackathon work. Uh, you can find it uh, in this GitHub tree. We have an open testing resolver uh, responding to the eDNS option. Uh, there's also, we also have a authoritative site sending the option in eBPF, which just works for any authoritative server. It augments the responses with this uh, option. Uh, there was an implementation uh, done by uh, Stefan Bortsmeier in uh, the authoritative name server Drink. It's a dynamic name server. It can do stuff when it's uh, queried uh, for uh, uh, stuff. And uh, it's great for experimentation. Here's the GitHub uh, uh, link for it. And besides sending the EDNS option, uh, Stefan also uh, started with uh, doing DNS errors, uh, reporting, processing. So do it, doing something with the uh, reports. So there's another authoritative implementation in the uh, name server, authoritative name server called Trex, which is NS1's proprietary uh, authoritative server. And it, it also worked, it's tested, it worked. Uh, Mark Andrews submitted a ticket for uh, a bind nine, and uh, also the authoritative site is already working. Uh, another project was to create NetDNS Resolver Unbound, pull bindings for lib unbound, and make that work with the uh, resolver in uh, NetDNS. 
And uh, last but not least, they encrypted client hello uh, 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 thing in uh, Connect by Name, a library that does uh, happy eyeballs, Dane, and everything you need to, to set up uh, sessions uh, uh, securely and privately. So we had a really good time. The food was amazing. Uh, DNS error reporting just rocks. So the, these were the participants. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up is. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Drip. D Rip. There we go. Drone remote identification. Okay, so uh, I'm Stu, and my affiliation for these purposes is a company called AX Enterprise. And how am I advancing? There we go. Nope. Yeah, I tried that. Okay, so what's DRIP? Um, wireless network-based equivalent of an auto license plate for uh, unmanned aircraft, what the media love to call drones. Um, the baseline standards are external to IETF, um, but the problem is the baseline standards are not well informed from the perspective of cryptographic network protocols, so uh, thus the DRIP working group, which uh, builds on the baseline external standards to um, provide those properties. So, nope, arrow keys are not working. Okay. Wrong focus here, maybe. Okay, I don't know what that means. No, right. Wrong focus. There we go. Thanks. Yeah. So um, the goals for uh, yesterday and today, um, we we've had to uh, be fairly careful with our language uh, in our drafts, and so we have endorsements that are largely in the sense of the uh, Rats Working Group, and. Um, Problem is, a lot of the uh, work that's been done uh, by Adam and myself is for an employer who unfortunately will not release it as open source. And so in the interests of, uh, of moving this forward within IETF, we want open source. So um, our volunteers worked on an independent implementation uh, that will be released as open source. It's already been uploaded. Um, and uh, this will produce endorsements and um, import and export them in the necessary formats for over the air. Uh, did the work in Python to get it done in two days. And also the uh, Linkaping uh, University implementation, which is open source uh, of DRIP and OpenHIP, needed to be brought up to the uh, latest draft level. And yeah, uh, our volunteers got it done and uh, demonstrated uh, this morning interoperability with the uh, closed source uh, implementation. And the uh, Linkaping University work is gonna be more extensive than could have got done in two days, uh, but we figured out what needs to get done. And so our new volunteers did need a little help from the folks who wrote the drafts, which suggests that the drafts need some clarification. We need to take the JSON out of the drafts and replace it with uh, CDDL. And we found some corner cases that will be addressed. And so our team leader was Adam. Wave your hand, Adam. And our volunteers on site, uh, Philip and Marius, put your hands. And uh, we also had uh, the Linkaping University folks in remotely. And Bob and I were here to uh, kibitz. And we really, really, really need reviewers for our drafts. That's it. Questions? Nope, next. Thanks. Thank you. Next is, uh, right, quick handshake classification. Yeah, thank you. Chance to indicate time. Wait a minute. Okay, perfect. All right, hey guys, uh, I'm Martin, this is Jonas. We're the quick handshake classification API team. And just to have a really quick, uh, or yeah, short recap of what are the design goals of Quick? Uh, basically, we have two things. We want to reduce the round trip times 
and optimally we have uh, one way uh, round trip time and also we want to prevent the amplification attacks so um, the servers are only allowed to respond to triple the, the bytes that the client sent to the server and we wanted to check whether current deployments actually comply with these design goals and obviously with the RFC and our starting point were two tools and we had quick reach and Keish, which we both extended. Uh, we extended quick reach by the retry support and uh, we extended Keish to support all three TLS compression algorithms. And in the end, we wanted to have an API which basically uses these two tools to perform uh, the checks we are interested in. So um, what do we got? Um, Basically, we now have an API and also a website which uses these, this API and you can enter any quick domain, for example, google.com, and then you see the results, how the quick handshakes behave. So for example, here now, the quick handshake with Google takes multiple round trip times because of large certificates. Uh, we have Cloudflare, which um, has a slight amplification uh, of four or a small amplification. Um, then we also have uh, the compression, which I talked about. So basically we show uh, how efficient the uh, um, compression levels are. So here in this example, we save around 30% of data if we activate the uh, certificate compression. So in the end, uh, we have an open website, which currently is under accessible under my private domain, but you can also, we are currently moving to understand the quick.net. So uh, please uh, check out uh, our tool, our API, and if there are any tests which you think are missing, just talk with us. And in the end, uh, we, this is not uh, about finger pointing. We just want to foster the discussions about quick handshakes and improve the deployments. Questions? Thank you very much. Next up is Young, Young Automation Tool. Are the presenters in the room? Yep. I see. Can you hear me? Oh, it's remote. Yeah, I, I'm remote. Okay, excellent. Okay, uh, I'm Funchun from Huawei. Uh, let me introduce our project, Young Model Tool Automation. Uh, next, please. Uh, there are three modif modifications uh, about uh, my <coughs> our project. Uh, firstly, Young Catalog Pro provides an uh, online Young Catalog validation tool, which can validate uh, Young models regardless of uh, dependencies, but there's no uh, offline tool can do it. Uh, second, Young Catalog only provides some query interfaces. Uh, it's difficult to fully meet the requirements of a Young model of automation. And thirdly, uh, no tool is available to compare two revisions of young model according to customized comprehension rules. Our goal is uh, developing a young aut automation tool to uh, compare young models by resolving dependencies uh, automatically and uh, provide the plug-in system to support the customized functions, for example, as for the young smart comparison according to customize the uh, comparison rule. Uh, the related draft uh, and after this uh, are list uh, below. Next. Uh, this figure uh, <coughs> show uh, the architecture of a young compiler. Uh, the model to be compiled uh, act as input and the young compiler will uh, uh, search uh, the the dependencies from a local repo. Uh, if not found, young compiler will re request the remote repo uh, fetch the needed dependence to uh, local repo. And uh, then um, after uh, build, building the young Sigma context, young compiler will, uh, uh, will call the plugins to uh, perform extended function. Next. 
uh, this figure show the workflow of Young Sigma compression plugin. The, the customize the compression drawers and uh, uh, <coughs> two revisions of Young modules act as input. And uh, uh, the plugin uh, will, <coughs> will con compare them and get the differences. Uh, and the uh, custom uh, rules uh, will be applied on this uh, difference and then output the, the uh, compression result, uh, including uh, compatibility uh, result. Next. You have one half minute. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, what, what we uh, learned, uh, young camera can improve young model automation and uh, uh, customize the uh, uh, compatibility rules can adapt to different scenarios. Uh, uh, our next steps uh, uh, are listed below. Next. Uh, thanks to our uh, team members. Uh, and we have two uh, reports uh, in GitHub. If you have some uh, have in interest on them, uh, please visit uh, any contributor are uh, welcome. Thanks, and oh. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? No? OK. Hands, clap. Thank you very much. Right, there we go. The next one is BMWG container benchmarking. Okay. Can you hear me? Also remote. Okay. Welcome. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm, uh, no, I'm from the IIT UC from South Korea. So uh, our hackathon activities is to uh, verify our consideration benchmark clean network performance containerized infrastructure draft. So we uh, discussed uh, different considerations that can affect container network performance. Uh, including network assessment model and different department configuration setting. Next slide, please. So in the uh, previous high school, we uh, have already started initial tests of the uh, EBF acceleration model performance with the uh, OBS IF HDP support switch. And uh, in the high we continue to explore other variation of the uh, EBF acceleration model via the VP B switch with a memory interface the Intel Cloud Native Data Plane with the coded IF HTTP plugin and the CLI. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is uh, the architecture of the VPI HTTP V switch. So the VP V switch is used for is a spay uh, is a spay V switch and uh, is part the packet from the IF HTTP socket to the IF HTTP promote driver. And for the chemistry between the V3 and container, it uses a shared memory interface. Next slide, please. Uh, for the CNDP, and, uh, the chemistry between the naked user space use the FSDP socket, the original one. And uh, the chemistry between the user space and container using the, their own Kubernetes CNI plugin. So this uh, plugin moved the network device from the host network space to the port network space directly attack the network device to the port so the port can uh, get the packet from the IF HTTP socket. Next slide, please. Uh, for Cilium, then Cilium is the only one that uh, utilizes the EBPF for both north-south and east-west traffic acceleration. The EBPF as the network NIC drivers for the north-south and uh, at the socket layer for east-west. Next slide, please. So this is our test beds. Cool. And so we use uh, EPF support NIC and uh, kernel with some CNI that we mentioned in the previous slide. Next slide, please. See the, our configuration. Next slide, please. Uh, this is what we learned. So we compare OBS v host, VP MAMIP, and CNDP. So VP outperform OBF VHOS because of the better performance of uh, MEMI against the VHOS. And the CNDP also it have different implementation of uh, EPF is still catch up, catch up the performance of VP with hyper package size. Next slide, please. Uh, 
uh, for the cilium, cilium they have already published their own benchmarking for their CNI, and uh, this uh, you can simply refer to their result. So the figure here shows the north south and east west traffic acceleration using EPPF on cilium. Next slide, please. So for the future work, we uh, in finalize the draft and ISO review. We would like to welcome any questions, comments, and contribution to our draft to start the WG adoption process. Next slide, please. This is our team member and we have project repository. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nice project. Are there any questions in the room? No? Okay. Then I thank you for your presentation. Thanks. Next up is, let's see, where are we now? Satellite network. That's all I have for you for now. But there we have a presenter. Excellent. Okay. 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 Hello, this is uh, Gao from Huawei, and I will give. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No. Okay. No. Mm. No. Okay. Okay. I'm Chandu Gao from Huawei, and I will give an introduction about the satellite work. Uh, and uh, um, this we have two parts. Okay. Uh, and uh, we have two parts of this work. One is the Habitat platform of the simulation platform, and the next is the uh, a platform from Nanjing University. Uh, and uh, about the Habitat platform, we have three passion parts. <coughs> and one is the generation of satellites, uh, the topology of the network. And the second is we use the topology to calculate the routing in the NS3. Uh, and the third part is uh, we will give a visualization uh, of the uh, satellites. Uh, and uh, about the uh, um, ultra-star platform, we have two parts. One is the, um, we can give a configuration, and the based the configuration, we can have a satellite topology. And the next, we can defect the satellite failure about the set. Uh, okay. Okay, uh, our development is based on the uh, Ubuntu links and uh, use the Python and the G and GCC. Okay. And uh, uh, this uh, the Habitat introduction we have the, we have three. Yeah, uh, let's just uh, introduce them before. Um, and uh, in the future, maybe we have more work about the like the orbit dynamic and the evaluation of the. Constellation performance and uh, the simulation of RTT, like like RTT and the other traffic performance in the future, maybe we can do. Uh, and the load balance and the routing algorithm, like this. Uh. Okay, this is our demo result. We have uh, no, we have three types. Uh. And this is the ultra star about the. Uh, it's doing about uh, from the Nanjing University, and uh, this we have the topology network management. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, from the two days of the hackathon, we uh, I think the simulation platform is very helpful to the satellite routing network and uh, other maybe other future other other area we can use the um, platform simulation another thing. Uh, and in the future, I think we, we maybe we will have the adapting more routing protocols to the simulation platform and to the satellite network. And uh, uh, we have another uh, TBR group. Yeah, this is we have both. And maybe we have some um, satellite use case um, to discuss uh, uh, in the both. And maybe the topology change the period is a common use case. Uh, and uh, in the future, maybe we have uh, some coverage with the partners. Uh, okay. Uh, this is our members, and we have an open community at the GitHub. If you have some interest, and you can join us. Uh, thank you. Mm. Any problem? Mm. Okay, thank you.
you very much. There we go. Uh, next. Uh, Alt VSG presentation. Is here in the room or remote? Around. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you. Yep. So I'm Jordi Rajvial. I'm with Qualcomm, and I'll be presenting our uh, hackathon optimizing XR flows in the edge cloud using Alto and ball neck structure graphs. Yeah. So the goal is to optimize XR flows, the steering of XR flows in the edge cloud. And the, the idea of uh, this hackathon is to use Alto get the state of the network and complement that with bottleneck structure graphs, which are currently not in the standard. It's been discussed, uh, but it's not uh, yet in the standard. So it's exploratory in terms of um, being able to explore uh, um, leverage um, some of these capabilities from the BSG graphs. Um, these are the, the RCs and the, including a, a draft on bottleneck structure graphs. Um, and so the, the challenge here is, is uh, about integrating end-to-end -end the whole uh, workflow, which I'm gonna present next. Um, yeah, so that's the workflow. So starting from a multi-domain network, mostly the edge, edge cloud, which could be Wi-Fi, 5G, 4G, and eventually 6G, uh, the idea is to close the loop. So on the right side, we have the host, the, the user equipment, if you will, uh, running an XR application. Then you would have um, you know, some kind of source routing algorithm, segment routing. And then to close the loop, um, you know, we have NetFlow, or you could use also SFlow. Then we have uh, the computational bottleneck structure graphs here, which is the, what does sort of the math. And then we uh, fit that into the Alto uh, server, which is the, the standard. Um, and then we have an Alto client pulling from, from the Alto server that information, the state of the network and the bottleneck structure of the network. And based on that, we compute an optimized path that um, ensures maximal throughput while maintaining uh, a latency requirement uh, based on the bottleneck structure analysis. And then we fit that into a uh, path computation uh, module that goes back into the source routing algorithm to help us steer the flow through the edge cloud and at, sort of at any point in time, help it, uh, help it find the best, uh, the best path possible. So uh, yeah, that's the, the, the topology that we've been testing against. It's a, it's a 5G topology. Uh, uh, it's actually extracted from an actual deployment in Philadelphia, but it's, um, everything is running in, in emulation mode, actually. This, um, and, um, and here we have, um, you know, there is um, an edge computing resource here. This could be, this would be the XR uh, server, and then um, and a host running the XR application, and then two possible paths to choose at any point in time based on the congestion dynamics of the, of the network. And this is the result of the demo that we are running. Uh, so uh, what we show here is, um, you know, you start the XR application, it's getting, getting 10 units of bandwidth, then congestion kicks in on that path, and then um, bottleneck structure graphs recompute in real time the, the dynamics of the system, find that there's a better path that still maintains the latency requirements. So, uh, so yeah, as congestion builds up, then eventually finds the better path and then switches back to, to, to find to, to higher throughput paths. So the blue, the blue flow here is the XR flow, you know, as congestion kicks in, then uh, eventually increases back to finding, to reroute, it reroutes and finds um, a higher throughput path to maintain, um, you know, to, at, the, at any point in time, giving you the, the highest throughput available. So what we learned, uh, yeah, so bottleneck structures graphs, as I mentioned, are currently being discussed in the Alto working group. They are not part of the standard, but this is um, a demo that allows us to sort of bring some, uh, some of the, uh, the foundations or the understanding of how this would work in integrated end-to-end -end with, with, to close the loop, you know, integration with, uh, with NetFlow, with um, SFlow and, and Alto and, and a source routing algorithm. Uh, the demo showed that it's, you know, that it's feasible to run this, uh, Actually, you know, in real time, uh, finding the, the you know the, the congestion dynamics of, of the problem, uh, we had actually uh, a deployment of this in, in a production network at uh, the National Research Platform in the in the U.S. Uh, and so the demo provides uh, some practical uh, feedback into the Alto working group. Um, the uh, the idea is that bottleneck structure graphs uh, provide a compact and a scalable approach to incorporate traffic engineering information into the Alto standard, which is something that the Alto standard 
currently doesn't do, but it's something that we're considering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's the team. Uh, so this is most people from Qualcomm, uh, Yale University, Caltech, uh, UCSD, um, and Sichuan University, and Huawei. Mm. It's part of, part of the Alto Working Group. And that's it. Thank you. Okay. Ah, sorry. Your mask is on. Up next, we have, uh, let's see, the right group over here, close by. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, um, yeah we, uh, I present for Riot, I'm Martin. Um, the other people that contributed to our several sub-projects are also listed there. In total, we had four sub-projects. Um, the first one was about integrating the ARM platform security architecture for crypto into Riot, um, where four, so, uh, uh, four problems were worked on. First of all, the persistent storage uh, for using PSA. Um, for that, we have now a working fork, um, and we can uh, store AES keys in flash memory. Um, then the integration of additional crypto backends. Um, for that, we also have a working fork uh, with the ST Safe A secure element, and it is possible now to switch between uh, different secure elements. Then. The third problem was the automatic selection of a crypto backend depending of the hardware capabilities. Um, that is now integrated into the build system of Riot with kconfig and make files. Um, and the problem of integrating the PSA architecture test suite was solved by integrating the test as a sort of Riot package. Um, so we can now run the tests that are provided by ARM. Um, the second project was to provide IPv6 support for uh, IEEE 800 e DSME using 6 LOPAN. For that, we have now a working implementation, and the review process for merging that into the Riot mainline has started. <laughs> um, then the third project we were working on is, uh, was a SHIC plug test between uh, the Riot implementation, which uses uh, the external libshik and openshik, uh, the openshik table. Um, on Saturday, we basically just did preparations and tried to find out what was possible. And then we found out that uh, on both sides with curve compression rules, there is some handling that still needs work. Um, on the libshik side, it's basically the map uh, mapping between the offsets uh, uh, but, uh, with offset, for example, when we use co-op types and when we try to compress uh, Euro components, uh, more than one Euro component, um, that uh, doesn't work either at the moment. And on the OpenShift side, uh, ETEX and blockwise option compression is not yet supported really. Um, so we agreed on some common SHIG rules, um, namely IP, IPv6, ICMP, and UDP just, and then used values based on our release specifications uh, to find a common ground. And then we did some plug testing today where we uh, found out that uh, the ICMP header message parsing still needs some work and that uh, it's probably a good idea to use coreconf to uh, address, uh, to configure routing and neighbor, uh, neighbors, which brings us to our last project, coreconf and uh, Riot, where uh, we now have a working dis uh, implementation. Um, the discovery of available models is still missing and uh, the problem, uh, uh, are that uh, what is mandatory to implement, uh, there you refer to the response specs and how to discover the capabilities of constrained devices. Um, uh, their response has a mechanism um, which is not available in CoreConf yet. Uh, and we, uh, there was some discussion to carry over RCMON uh, over to CoreConf. And uh, yeah, future work is then provide a pull request in Wyatt. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you very much. Next we have uh, 
uh, let's see, Riot, and then SRV6 data plane visibility. There we are. Excellent. Left, right. Okay, very good. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, uh, I'm Yannick Fuchs from Swisscom, and I have Alex Hong uh, Feng from INSA University of Lyon. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, so it was about the uh, data plane visibility in SRV6. So basically, the goal of our exercise was to validate and uh, visualize two IPFIX implementations of the IPFIX SRV6 SRH draft. We got just in time uh, one implementation for Huawei, uh, Huawei VRP, and another implementation done by INSA uh, of uh, the VPP. So the first topology we built for the Huawei VRP uh, topic was uh, composed of eight nodes. We see um, the egress nodes on the left upper corner there, uh, where we um, configured three, uh, three different SRV6 traffic engineering policies, where we push uh, these seed lists, which accomplish then the three different colored paths, which we want to see then uh, in the visual visualization uh, at the end of the pipeline later on. Um, yeah, of course, to get these flows exported, we had then to set up uh, some traffic across, uh, which we did uh, from the upper node there. Uh, the second topology? Yeah, the second topology we tested was uh, the VPP one. Uh, so we had uh, the topology is a simpler one. We have only three nodes with a semen routing policy between the first node and the third one. Third one. And we are using traffic engineering to send uh, the packets uh, through, through the topology. The goal here was to implementing the IP fix export uh, of this uh, semi routing header. So on each node at ingress interface, we are aggregating the data for uh, for each uh, semi routing uh, flow and exposing it uh, to IP fix. Exactly. So at the end of our pipeline, which actually had also to be, uh, um, as you said, enhanced to decode these new uh, elements, uh, we have this nice visualization where we see, uh, uh, you cannot see it, but you can see it if you download the PDF later on. We see in the first number the segment list, so which corresponds to the, poli so the three different policies we had um, before. And then for this, you can uh, just trace the, the path uh, with the se segment left. And you see also which active segment is used for forwarding. And of course, you see the peer IP source, uh, so from which node this has been exported. Yeah, so to conclude, what we achieved uh, through this hackathon was uh, testing this uh, semen routing uh, policy within uh, different topologies. We validated the, this uh, IPFIX uh, draft and uh, also uh, testing the whole pipeline. So uh, um, reading from the database, uh, the collected data. And a funny thing, we, we also tested the actual use case. We had two, two members of the team working on the database and two members working on the topology. And the database team actually saw these changes and oh, there was uh, a, a change in the network. So for uh, next step, we are working on um, uh, on path telemetry, which is a draft uh, who tries to export the delay between uh, every node. And then we we will try to also validate uh, this data plane of visibility for X SRV6 uh, in L2 and L3 eVPNs. And uh, we just uh, posted a new draft uh, with minor updates uh, today. So what we learned, so also thanks to our hackathons uh, neighbors, our crowded uh, team were, um, was able to invade all the other tables and uh, gain uh, some power and space. Uh, as always, beers are, are always uh, welcome. And uh, a bad thing is uh, that uh, in, in our lab access was uh, a tricky thing. And uh, yeah, to wrap up, that's uh, our team. So thank you very much.
Thank you all. Thank you. And I want to thank everyone also for keeping on the given time slot of four minutes. It's going great. Thanks. Next up, we have, let's see, uh, Nesquik. I've seen them somewhere over there. Yeah, there they are. Nesquik. That works, the next week. <laughs> That's why everyone is it. Okay, good. Um, so um, I'm Maxime, uh, this is Francois. So we're PhD students from uh, UC Louvain, working with uh, our advisor, Prof Professor Olivier Bonaventure. And so we've been working on, on Nesquik and Nesquik is not just a cocoa powder that you've been uh, seeing on the table. It's also uh, a tool that we are shaping up uh, to do um, uh, network testing or internet performance testing with Quick. So the goal for the Hackathon uh, was to try to do quick measurements with uh, MLab NDT. So MLab NDT is a tool from Measurement Lab. Um, if you don't know uh, this tool, the easiest way to access it is just Google speed test. And then you will find a pop-up that prompts you if you would like to do a speed test. And so that's part of the MLab initiatives, who is collecting, uh, which is collecting so um, uh, speed tests uh, from all over the all around the world in this. So our goal was to do um, was to try to integrate uh, quick measurements into this tool. And so we took uh, quick HTTP three and we transferred and tried to integrate all that into uh, the tools of MLab. So um, we did actually quite well. So we have a working prototype which uh, integrates Quick Go. The, the quick implementations into the NDT server. Um, and on the client side, we have switched from WebSockets to WebTransport in the NDT uh, JavaScript client side code. Um, and so thanks to Google Chrome and, um, and, and WebTransport Go, we were able to make the two discuss together. And so now we have some proof of concept for um, download and upload tests uh, using HTTP3 and quick right from the um, from the browser. So um, that's just one of the first points. So why, why, why are we doing this? Uh, we're interested into doing uh, quick um, internet performance measurements because with, with quick we can have uh, much more precise um, metrics about delays, loss, loss patterns and stuff like that. Um, and then we will need to, in that way, we will need to uh, update also like how do we get metrics from the quick stacks up to the uh, to this uh, measurement performance. So look at what we can have similar to TCP info um, and benefit from all that and to do end-to-end -end measurements over the internet because quick goes through any type of data in the way. Uh, so that's it, I guess. Uh, if you're interested in that, go uh, go come chat with us. We will be staying at the Nesquik table for, for a while. Thank you. Thank you. There we go. And in this quick, we just had L4S. All the impressive equipment over there. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right. Hello, thanks, uh, everyone. Um, I'm Greg White, Table Labs, and joining me is Bundes Hepe. Hi. Um, this is the second uh, interop for the L4S project uh, at the IETF Hackathon. Uh, first one was at IETF 114 in Philadelphia. Um, and uh, L4S, if you're not familiar, it stands for low latency, low loss and scalable throughput. Uh, it's a new congestion control and active queue management architecture for the internet. Um, there are three core drafts, uh, which are uh, currently in the RFC editor queue um, that define the architecture and components. Um, there's also um, a fourth draft, which covers the congestion feedback for TCP, um, which we refer to as ACT for DCN. There are three components to the architecture, the sender side congestion control, 
um, the congestion feedback in the network, or congestion signaling in the network, and the feedback at the receiver side to uh, feedback that congestion signal to the sender. So we have uh, multiple implementations at the table, the long table in the back there. Um, on the congestion control side, we have uh, Apple Quick Prog, uh, Linux TCP Prog, uh, Google BBRv2 is a TCP implementation, and two real-time congestion controllers, one from Nokia uh, called RT Prog and one from Ericsson called Scream. Um, and then there are similarly five uh, marking feedback implementations at the receiver side. Um, quick TCP and uh, real-time um, applications. There also are a couple of, um, some of the testing we've been doing is using um, iPerf to send TCP or quick traffic, um, but some of the testing also uses, uh, for the real-time applications, uh, use video streaming that uh, adapts the video codec rate based on available capacity in the path and maintaining ultra low latency uh, along the way. All right. Um, on the bottleneck side in the network, we've got four implementations there, um, Wi-Fi um, and 5G and fixed network uh, from Nokia, as well as a 5G network from Ericsson um, that uh, is, is running in the room and uh, we've been testing uh, multiple links uh, there. Is that done so far? I'll hand it over to Tim. Yeah, so uh, a lot of uh, interrupt testing has been done, too much to uh, explain, I think. Um, so, with a, mainly a lot of congestion controls have been tested on different platforms and also a lot of congestion controls have been testing against each other whether they converge to the same rate, which is of course important if multiple applications share the same bottleneck, that they're evenly dividing the, the flows. And we still are here for uh, a few days more after the hackathon to uh, do further interrupt tests uh, going on. Um, maybe one of the results, and to show you why it's important to have Alpharez, is on a, on a typical 5G network, you see at the top the latencies, uh, uh, which are with classic TCP up to 400, uh, in reality even above a second, if, if you really do downloads. With these Alpharez here, we have 99% uh, path below a few milliseconds, 2, 3, 99.99, uh, uh, 4 milliseconds, you can see it in the slides uh, for the details. Uh, and I think then, Sure, so we have quite a number of organizations participating this time. Um, this is on the, on the slide, I won't uh, uh, read through them all, but um, and uh, in terms of actual individuals listed here, 21 folks that are joining us, most in, or many in person, there are a few that are remote um, participating as well. Uh, and then finally, to wrap up, um, this isn't the end of uh, interoperability testing for L4S. We, um, this is actually, this, I, I mentioned the second uh, one at IETF. There actually was one in the interim between last IETF and here that was hosted at Cable Labs in, uh, in Denver. Um, we do plan a second one um, in Denver at, uh, in January, and then we'll look at uh, scheduling uh, at IETF 116 at Yokohama. So if you're interested in participating, uh, reach out to me um, and I'll help you get involved. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sorry, you, you will be around for the next couple of days in the, here in the hackathon room? Okay, excellent. So people interested, the group will be working in that corner for the next uh, week until Thursday. Right. Next up, we have, let's see. Uh, oh, sorry, this almost forgot that one. The open, I don't know how to pr pronounce it, open C C H C. Presenter here? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I just learned from Martin how to pronounce it, but I already forgot it. Hi all. Um, so this is the, the work that we've done at the open check table in that corner over there. Um, okay, slides. How do I open this? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Advanced slides? Okay, yeah. just some delay. Yeah. Good. Um, so a little background, which is Chick. Uh, Chick is a head of compression and fragmentation uh, for um, IP protocols over uh, very constrained networks, which are usually referred to as uh, LP1s. Uh, you might have heard of uh, Sigfox, LoRaWAN, for example. If you know six low band, uh, we're talking even more constrained net networks than six low band. We were targeting payloads uh, from 10 to 100 bytes, and they trades from uh, 100 bits a second to a few tens of kilobits a second. That's our uh, area of operation. Um, the, the work, the specification work is done at the LP1 working group in the inter area, and we've produced a few RSCs already with more coming. Um, and so uh, over the years uh, in the hackathons and between the hackathons, we have developed an open source implementation of this uh, protocol um, in Python 3. And uh, this project is called OpenCheck. Um, and we're very happy that it was uh, adopted by the LoRaWAN Alliance as a reference code to certify the IP over, uh, IPv6 over LoRaWAN devices at the LoRa Alliance. Um, okay, I pressed the button and nothing happened. Yes, okay, some delay. Uh, so what have we achieved uh, over this weekend? We cleaned up the, the GitHub repo for our project, merged a few development branches, cleaned up you know, uh, uh, dead code, etc. Uh, improved the documentation. We have a tutorial to go with the, the code which is a step-by-step -step instructions uh, uh, on how to run examples and get acquainted with the code. Um, we also had a newcomer, uh, experience engineer, but newcomer to the IETF and the LP1 working group who decided to develop a new uh, clean slate implementation uh, in MicroPython, which is very handy for constrained devices. Um, we also had one participant designing a connector between OpenCheck and a real uh, network server for Sigfox networks, so we can exchange packets over a real radio network. And we did uh, interrupt testing with the Riot team, as was mentioned before. We exchanged a few compressed packets both ways. Uh, very simple. It's a start, but good news and also uh, working on the interrupt between the MicroPython imp clean slate imp implementation and the, the legacy OpenShift implementation. Um, and what we learned, having a newcomer read the RFCs, uh, you know, with a fresh look is always refreshing. Lots of good questions came up about, you know, how the RFC is worded and also design choices. Where did you do this this way or that way? And, uh, you know, we could do things in a slightly different way using the same toolbox because it's a generic uh, protocol. Uh, and so this led to some ideas. We might extend the young model, uh, do little protocol extensions to do things differently, which might be better on a very constrained device, for example. And of course, we'll uh, bring that feedback to the working group during the week or at an interim later on. And that's it. That's the team with two newcomers. And Happy to talk to you uh, about OpenCheck if you are interested. There we go. Chico's project presentation. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Uh, so T-Cozy is a, an implementation of uh, Cozy. Uh, Cozy is a CBOR object signing encryption, a, a, a new message uh, new format for signing and encrypting messages. So TCOSI uh, stands for Trusted COSI. Uh, it's a C implementation of 9052 and 9053, suited for uh, small devices uh, and small memory use. Uh, it's aiming for commercial quality. 
and uh, it uses it can use either the OpenSSL or embed PLS uh, crypto libraries. Um, so here's the uh, hackathon pro progress, kind of relative to what happened in uh, 114 to 115. So uh, we uh, compared to one uh, at 114, we we've got uh, Mac Zero. Uh, it's a, so a, it's a format for Mac messages. That is now uh, kind of on its uh, pretty well integrated into what will be uh, TCOSY 2.0. Uh, we're supporting custom headers. Uh, that's pretty well integrated. And uh, we're kind of halfway through uh, COSY sign, which is multiple signers, and uh, probably halfway through, maybe not quite, for COSY encrypt. So that, that's uh, COSY encrypt uh, with um, HPKE, which is uh, a bit of a moving target at this point. So that was our progress for the, for the hackathon. And then uh, briefly, uh, there's other progress that wasn't kind of really hackathon related uh, since uh, 114. And that was uh, uh, RSA and EDDSA was integrated into uh, TCOSA 1.0. Um, that will eventually move to TCOSA 2.0. And uh, just uh, this is a GitHub project, uh, TCOSA, so happy for you to use it or, or contribute. Uh, thank you. So next is WebRTC, Encoded Media, here in the room. Ah, there's, oh, wait. I think that's going to say error. Page down. Okay. okay, this will be short. There isn't that much to talk about. So, idea came up at uh, last TPAC in September, and uh, WHC, that we should, uh, before we start uh, defining new APIs, we should really try to play with them. So, uh, we suggested to have take the opportunity of a hackathon, of course. It was a bit short because, uh, well, only I showed up here. A couple of others in expressed interest but couldn't make it in the weekend. But uh, we wanted to define some APIs, which is not what the IDF customarily does, but uh, these APIs manipulate stuff that is then passed through IDF protocols, so it kind of links to the IDF. And we got some working code done. This, stuff, this is totally unreadable. And so if you want to, want to see what it actually is, then uh, just get a GitHub. But uh, the source is available. I had fun. And we got a little bit further towards uh, figuring out what can be done and what's, what doesn't need to be part of the specifications. So, have fun. Thank you, Howard. Right. right, so here we are. Where is Alto visibility? Open Alto implementation. Presenter here. I'm online. Thank you. Awesome. Um, so I want to talk briefly about implementation, deployment, um, and LHC1 use cases for the Open Alto project. Next slide. So the Open Alto project is an open source implementation of IETF's Alto. And then we also worked on openalto.org, which is a running deployment of this Open Alto project. Next slide. Specifically, openalto.org is used with LHC1, a layer three VPN for high energy physics data out of CERN. Next slide. Next slide, please. So what we got done during this hackathon was primarily focused on visibility of LHC1 network routing states. And then we also briefly touched on um, Alto-based replica sorting and integrating this visibility into data flow orchestration. Next slide, please. 
So our first achievement on the visibility side was GOIP and geodistance. And this quite simply was allowing endpoints to use the standard Alto endpoint cost service to gain geodistance information. Next slide. Next slide, please. Our second achievement um, was on obtaining routing paths. So there are many ways to accomplish this, but we focused on the data plane um, using looking glasses, G2 snapshots, and equivalent classes. Next slide, please. Um, on the looking glass implementation, we were retrieving forwarding information bases from um, looking glasses in CERN and Giant, and we're able to uh, query the path vector through that. Next slide, please. Um, for the data path sampling driven implementation, we were able to obtain similar information using equivalent classes, and this was in reference to National Research Platform. Next slide, please. Um, our third achievement, uh, on which we made good progress but was not completed by the end of the hackathon, um, is using openalto.org as a global query orchestration platform. So the idea is that this allows uh, multi-domain query processes in LHC1. Um, the process is generally looking up the source IP in IRR to obtain the source AS, querying the appropriate Alto server associated with this source AS to obtain the AS path, and then refining that AS path into a general path representation, which I won't go into detail here, but a good description can be found in a recent working group email. Next slide. We have one half minute. Um, and then our final achievement was uh, integration of this visibility that we'd established into Rusio source selection. Next slide, please. Uh, so this first involved the configuration of Alta resources to fetch um, information about Rusio replicas, and then expressing how we needed these Rusio replicas to be sorted. And final slide, please. And we are able to deploy this Rusio implementation integration into Mininet that support that partially simulated LHC1 networks and saw success in this integration. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lauren. I2 NSF project presentation. Yeah, excellent. So hello, uh, this is John Projong from I2 NSF working group. So basically, uh, we want to propose a new uh, security-facing interface for I2NSF for multi-domain environment. So this is the poster for our project. So basically, this uh, figure shows the framework of I2NSF framework. So uh, this time, we want to uh, implement IPsec for protection based on SDN. So basically, Article C90 61 is for one domain IPsec flow protection. But this time we propose to um, west and east bound security facing interface for multi domain environment. So, this figure you can see. So, we have two uh, domain, domain A and B. So, security control A governs domain A, and on the other hand, security control B governs domain B. So, basically, NSF2 and NSF3 are belonging to uh, two different uh, domains. So we want to set up IPsec flow uh, using uh, I2NSF. So basically, you can see security uh, controller B uh, providing um, IPsec Ike, so parameter through uh, security controller A, and finally, NSF2. Also, NSF3 can get uh, security um, related parameter can get from B. So. Uh, this one can be done using our proposal. So this uh, figure is um, PAD, um, Pure Authorization Database, uh, Ike, and uh, Security Policy Database. You can snapshot. 
So this one or also snapshot. So once uh, Ike uh, version two protocol exchange is done, and then you know uh, ESP uh, packet uh, trouble between um, two network security functions. So uh, in the middle, nobody can uh, catch the information because ESP packet uh, delivered. Okay, so we got done. Uh, so during uh, this hackathon, uh, we showed the IT stack uh, security association uh, can be done using our i 2 NSF extension. And next step, uh, we want to also implement the ICLIS case, which means security controller can generate uh, SA parameters instead of uh, IC button two. So this is our open source guitar, this is a video clip, and this is our team. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Yeah, this this one. One. yeah, yeah okay. okay, great. This is efficient. <laughs> there you go. Okay, hello. Uh, this is the second presentation. The IPMON uh, is a new uh, BOP. I tried to uh, introduce this BOP. So the basically, IP basics moving object and networking is after IP wave working group work. So we want to uh, provide the V2X, V2V, V2, V2, V2I among many kinds of uh, uh, moving vehicles, uh, such as uh, a vehicle, terrestrial vehicle, or aerial vehicle, drones, also the marine vehicles. So this one based on our IP wave working group problem statement. This is uh, uh, already uh, almost ready, uh, uh, approved by uh, IC almost, okay? So uh, you can see many kinds of uh, objects here. So we want to build uh, the vehicle architecture uh, using many kinds of uh, um, vehicles. You can see pedestrian, terrestrial vehicle, and drones, aerial vehicle, and also marine vehicle, something like that. So we also take advantage of uh, 3GPP 5G V2X protocol uh, in addition to um, L211 OCD mode. So this is a poster. So basically, uh, we want to prove the concept uh, context aware navigation protocol for IP based vehicular network. Also, we implemented our work uh, using um, OMNet++ plus plus, uh, simulation and 5G, uh, Shimu uh, 5G. For basically, you can see, so the drones can communicate with uh, each other, also deliver each um, position information to server through the, in the middle, we have a G node B and connect to uh, the server. So cover, collect, and then they provide the, uh, some efficient uh, navigation for three-dimensional drone um, paths. So what got done? So uh, we checked whether our uh, 5G stuff uh, can be uh, implemented for uh, context of your navigation protocol. So uh, we proved the 5G similarity can be uh, used. Also, so in the uh, next step, we try to uh, implement uh, multi address of configuration and also routing uh, efficiently. This is open source, and this is a demonstration. So, um, so we got, uh, so 5G uh, V2X is uh, feasible for IP version 6 uh, networking. This is uh, my team members, so thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. one post quantum crypto yeah oh correct this one okay okay hi I'm John Gray from Entrust and uh, this is first hackathon for myself and I think pretty much everyone on our table. So we had a lot of fun. So our goals for this event was essentially interop testing of uh, PQ uh, keys, certificates, PKCS10, essentially X509 based artifacts and um, also using the new NIST crypto primitives, uh, 
dilithium, talcum, and sphinx, and also alone, but also in combination with uh, uh, in composite combinations with traditional and uh, with traditional uh, crypto as well. Also, we wanted to solve ASN1 encoding issues to help clarify specifications um, and obtain experience using these new algorithms, and also provide an artifact repository uh, so that other people can also use these artifacts for their own testing purposes. Um, I just referenced some RFC drafts that, that we used. There was a lot of them. Um, and also, there's been standards around X509 for like 25 years, so we're also using those. Okay, so what got done? So we did create a uh, GitHub artifact repository that's actually in the hackathon. So you can see there's the link right there. It's called PPC certificates, so take a look. Um, yeah, we also defined a zip file format. Um, just to make it easier for interoperability testing between the different artifacts that we each produce. Um, we also agreed on public and private key encoding, so a little bit more on that later. And uh, the other thing, we have seven different implementations that we're testing, um, so I think this is a great success for, you know, first time hackathon. We have um, four vendor implement implementations and also three open source implementations involved, Bouncy Castle, OpenSSL, and Python. Uh, so what we learned, so there was a lot of discussion in the mailing list about octet string encodings, but there's actually, it turns out there's a, a SEC one draft from a while ago that basically says to, to treat a bit string and octet string identically. So once you do that, it solves the problem. You save four bytes as well. So, you know, over time, four bytes might save, you know, gigabytes of data. So anyway, that was a good way to solve that. Um, and we agreed with that for the private key. Um, we also were having some issues with octet strings, wrapping octet strings. We decided there's no point in doing that, um, and we'll use the representation from 5958. Um, the other thing we talked about was object IDs. Um, at this point, there's no standard object IDs. Uh, we know NIST is going to be um, uh, standardizing them soon, but until then, we need to be flexible at this point, so we have also need to make our implementations flexible to read different types of OIDs. We also suggest using uh, an ARC a version and a security level, so you can actually encode some data into the OIDs. And the most issues found, that we found anyway, are not related to the PQ algorithms. So the last slide, I just wanted to wrap up. Again, this was pretty much a team of first timers. There were 16 of us, and uh, yeah, we had a lot of fun. We are planning to continue to meet on a monthly basis. So the next meeting's uh, Monday, December 5th at 12 UTC time. We actually have people around the world all the way from Australia, yeah, all over. So if anyone wants to join us, you're welcome to do that. And we also plan to expand the artifacts and go into protocols in the future. So thank you. Thank you to see that was a good first experience for you at the hackathon. Um, Next one is Soat Stream, if I pronounce it correct. Is it remote or in person? Okay, there you are. Uh, so hi everyone, I'm Stephen McQuiston from the University of Glasgow, um, and the project that I was working on was streamlining social decision making for improved internet standards, so slightly different to the talks we've had so far. Now our plan at this hackathon was to try and measure the sentiment on the ITF at ITF.org list, so using NLP techniques to try and measure whether or not the tone or the levels of toxicity on this mailing list have been changing over time, identify people that are posting negative or positive messages, and, and basically to analyze trends in that data set. So what we got done is we ran all of the emails sent on that list through a tool called Vader. Um, and again, that just gave us scores in terms of how positive, negative, or neutral each message was. We then started to plot the broad trends that we could see in the data set both over time and for individuals um, and, and answering other questions about the data that we gathered. We developed some tooling 
um, previously, and during the hackathon, we identified places where we could perhaps improve the documentation or the packaging for that tooling. So what we learned was that uh, broadly the ITF, uh, ITF.org list is positive or neutral. So about 65% of the messages are identified as being positive, um, about 15% are neutral, and then the remainder were identified as being negative. Um, that's not really changed over time. It maybe feels like it has, but according to the data, it hasn't. We've got some initial evidence of some slightly more interesting trends. Um, again, it's relatively low levels of negativity that we found. We found more negativity on weekends. Um, we found that people using their personal addresses versus perhaps corporate addresses were more negative, uh, and that people were strangely more positive on Mondays. Um, I don't know. I don't know why. Um, the, the, uh, the sort of other takeaway that we had was that sentiment analysis over technical uh, language is pretty difficult. You know, phrases like drop packets and kill process and abort transmission are all on the face of it negative using the tooling, but of course are fairly neutral phrases given the, given the context. And we need to work on that. We need to build a lexicon of these phrases that we can identify as being neutral. Uh, just to wrap up, we had team members from the University of Glasgow and from Queen Mary University of London. We've got lots more information. We've published papers on various other data sets around the ITF at that link. If you're interested in any of this, there's going to be a side meeting on researching internet standards processes on Thursday afternoon. Uh, there's more information at that link. just want to conclude uh, with a request for your help. We're trying to build a tool that will help working groups to identify suitable reviewers for their drafts. Uh, that's based on context from emails and from other data sources that lets us know the interests of different participants. We then scan the drafts to identify the topics and then try and match the two up. We've got a tool that will let you look at different drafts and to see if our suggestions are correct. So if you scan that QR code or visit our website, you can use that tool and give us some feedback on it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I wondered why if you saw impact of the power outage on the, the mailing list. Um, let's see. This is the VCOM hackathon presentation. Oh, there you are. Great, thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Thomas. Uh, Dan and I worked on VCONs for this hackathon. I'd like to, I'm sure VCONs are new to most of you. A VCON is a, converse, is a co container for a conversation and it has four parts. Um, and I really love the sentiment analysis of the last group. I want to remind them though that if you have a model or a conclusion that you've used for with customers' data, with people's data. If they take their data away, you have to retrain your model. What VCONs help you do is keep track of what data you used to create what information downstream for personal privacy informations and to support artificial intelligence and machine learning. So what did we accomplish? Um, Dan and I, uh, redactions. So VCONs carry the information of a conversation and, but not all the information that's contained in it is appropriate for every single business use. For instance, it is, there's no reason for a business analyst to know what your birthday is. So uh, what we did was we used VCONs to implement transcriptions. And what we did was we used uh, OpenAI's Whisper program to transcribe it. Uh, then we also used Capital One's data profile to identify which personal information existed in the, the, uh, the transcript. Then we use those two, those two together to redact the transcript. Um, we could have used text-to-speech to really um, depersonalize it, where you wanted to save something for IETF 116. Uh, so what did we learn? It basically works. Um, but we also learned that maybe specifying um, and uh, standardizing a transcription object would allow us to use different transcriptions engines and 
be able to test them more reliably. Um, I want to show you uh, uh, what we came out with. So here's an example of our, of our work. We use the at sign for the redaction. And this is actually for my, my particular job. Thank you. Uh, my, my company sells new cars for a living. And we, about a million times a year, we take people's personal information and we're looking for better ways to handle them. Here's a transcript of a customer conversation, a couple wins, a couple losses. Uh, apparently the agent's name is not private and of course that it is, but the, but the car's name apparently is considered to be private and it's not. Um, but I will tell you one thing, which is really um, the point behind the beacon. If you notice part of this conversation, he says, I'm putting the volume up because you're so loud. We have a hundred agents that work all around the, the world and we have no idea what the audio quality is between any two participants in a call. This told us that for some reason, before our agent got in the phone, it was a low volume call. We wouldn't have known that without looking at the VCon because we needed our customer to tell us that. Okay, so for more information, um, we have a mailing list. We've just submitted our internet draft. Uh, we're going to be at the Hard RFC later on today. Uh, but the best one's the VCon Barboff. It's gonna be on Thursday. If you're thirsty or interested in VCons or just thirsty, come visit us at the, uh, at the Boff. Thank you. Thank you. Here we go. Uh, let's see. Moving on. Okay. NTP. David. Hello all, I'm David Venner. Uh, we spend, together with a few other people at the NTP table, the weekend uh, working towards NTP. Uh, the plan was mainly to work towards NTP v5, um, focusing on, uh, for now, experimental implementations, see if we ha the implementations we have are interoperable, uh, and see also what technical issues we still run into in the draft uh, as it stands. Um, so what we got done, there's now two, two experimental implementations that both are verified and interoperable, yay. Um, we uh, did some work on draft identification for NTPv5 so that once we start to make a lot of revisions to these drafts, we can keep track which implementations use which drafts and which servers use which drafts. So that's nice. Uh, we've identified a few minor uh, bugs in, uh, particularly the NPD RS implementation of NPV5, and we've had a lot of discussions on timescales and leap seconds because those are always difficult. Um, there were two main takeaways that we've uh, got from the uh, weekend. That is that timescale offsets uh, will need a little bit more attention, particularly around UT1. Uh, again, because UT1 is currently defined as being always within a second of UTC, but leap seconds may or may not go away in the future, and at that point, time differences might become too big for the current data types. And we've identified uh, that we still need to work a little bit on the kiss of death uh, packet uh, mechanism for NTPv5, because currently um, there's not sufficient mechanism for that in the specification. Um, so these are the people who worked on uh, the NTP stuff this weekend and some links to both the NTPv5 draft and the two dra uh, experimental implementations. Are there any questions? Good. Thank you. Um, yeah, reaching the end. Um, one tax API presentation. That's remote or in person? Hi, can you hear me? Remote, okay. Okay, um, so give a brief overview of some stuff I looked at this weekend. Um, next slide, please. So 
looking at RFC 8032 and um, one of the issues raised from the last hackathon is that there's suggested a new series of test vectors um, which might uh, give different results uh, with different implementations of um, ADDSA. So next slide, please. So idea is to look at um, different libraries. And I guess uh, this weekend I was just able to look at NACL. And there's been previous work on a port of NACL to JavaScript. Um, and also found a few other libraries. And I guess one was mentioned earlier today. So I hope to look at that as well. Um, next slide, please. And so what we found is that uh, NSAL implementation in C, original one, and the port to JavaScript pass and fail the same tests. Um, next slide. And that's it. Um, so there's an autumn in progress uh, to try and update this uh, RFC. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Thanks. Next one is WebRTC Encoded Media presentation. Remote? Or the, okay, it's it's jumped to the to the bottom then. Yeah. It's yours, Harold. Okay. Then we go to let's see. No, oh just It was a presentation without a title, probably uh, <laughs> in Nordic. Sorry. <laughs> okay, next up is. Okay. I think we have this all already. Okay, okay, so there's some doubleurs here, doubleurs. TLS hackathon, just. Okay, so this is. Are there any presentations without Yeah, so there are some. Some doubles here. Yeah, I have one tested TLS presentation. Yeah. Okay. Use the right, so I uh, wanted to give a very quick update on our work on Atlas TLS, so at the intersection of, yeah, that's a photo of us, uh, at the intersection of RATS and TLS working groups. So we're trying to introduce a new TLS extension um, to add support for uh, attestation evidence and results as first class credentials um, in TLS, so instead of X5 MS certificates. Um, our goal is to support both um, background check and uh, passport models and to support both sides of the um, TLS handshake to be able to attest themselves um, for authentication. Uh, but for, for the proof of concept that we're actually working on, uh, we focus mostly on uh, the client attesting themselves um, and using attestation evidence um, as the credentials. So we've been working on uh, free fronts essentially. So the first part is um, adding uh, support uh, in embed TLS for the handshake. So uh, trying to bring it up to speed with our, with our draft. Uh, then on the root of trust side, uh, we're trying to use a TPM and we're trying to adapt Parsec to produce the, the correct type of evidence. Um, and then on the verifier side, uh, we're trying to use Verizon and adding support for um, for the same kind of formats uh, that Parsec is producing. Um, yeah, so what we've learned mostly is that we had some gaps um, in some of our formats. 
for example, for in the in the evidence, we needed to include uh, some inbound reference to the verification key, the testing key, um, and also uh, the interface between Verizon and BetKLS. We needed to um, embed some sort of identity key, the the, the identity key that's going to be used in a uh, in the TLS handshake. So yeah, that's that's something to to do and change the documentation as well. And yeah, that's about it. This this is our team, and we're trying to harbor this under the Confidential Computing Consortium. Thank you. Thank you. So this is the final presentation we have in the in the Mute Echo. Did we miss a present project presentation? No. Okay. Then I'll ask Charles to do the closing. Uh, I think you want to go here. Okay. Uh, great. Well, well, thank you everyone for those great presentations. Benno, fantastic job running through them all. Uh, may have been a record number. I'll have to go and, and check uh, our previous totals. But uh, really appreciate um, all of you joining the hackathon, all the great work you did, and, and sharing your results. Uh, that was really fantastic. Um, another thing I'd like to invite you to do is um, tomorrow we have Hack Demo Happy Hour. It's from 6 to 7. It'll be in this room. I think this room won't be quite as large. It'll be divided up, but we'll have... Uh, some space here with tables, we'll have a, a cash bar. Um, and so what you do is you sign up and then you'll get some space where you're welcome to set up, uh, laptops, whatever, signboards, and you can talk to people about your projects in, in more detail, right? You'll have a whole hour where you can go a more in-depth conversation about what you did and, and discuss with them some of the finer points around it. So I encourage any of you who are able and wanting to, to do that, to take advantage of that opportunity. Uh, we usually get at least 10 or so teams sign up and have a, a good crowd of people coming through, some of who participated in the hack uh, hackathon, but a lot of them who, who weren't here, who are just arriving now and, and maybe heard about what you were doing. So um, it usually ends up being a really good opportunity, a really good experience. The other thing, uh, I think you heard the L4S team is going to remain with their stuff set up and they'll be continuing to do some work during the week. Uh, all of you are welcome to do that. We'll have space in this room um, set up kind of as the, the IETF lounge, but also as the code lounge. A part of it will be kind of separated off. We'll make sure we have ample power and whatnot for, for you to come down. Uh, if you want to, you can, uh, you don't need to reserve space or anything like that, but there is a, 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 a sign up board where you can just advertise to everyone else when you plan to be here just to help coordinate schedules a bit. So uh, you can go to the, the web page that's there, you can sign up and you're also free just to pop down here anytime. So that will continue um, throughout the week, Monday through Friday. Uh, then I uh, mentioned this before, but also wanted to say it again. We, we really do appreciate our sponsors. I think I know I had many people tell me, hey, you know, like the, the food and, and beverages here, that was really great. They appreciated that. Uh, so, you know, thanks to the, uh, um, our, our, our sponsors for that, we were able to, to make that happen. I think we all appreciated it. And for each hackathon, we always uh, need new sponsors or are looking for, for new and additional sponsors. As you can see here, we're able to have more than one that you have sponsorship at different levels. Um, so uh, that's all very appreciated and enables us to continue to, to do this and, and to have a nice setup and all that. So um, please encourage if you work for an employer or anyone else who, who might be able to sponsor us in the future, that'd be great. And I want to give a, an early reminder for uh, the next opportunity, the next hackathon. It'll be uh, in Yokohama. So 
what I have up here are the dates of the entire IETF meeting. I guess uh, the Saturday and the Sunday it will be the hackathon. So the 25th, 26th, that weekend of March. Uh, maybe mark your calendars and start uh, planning your, uh, your time so that you can, you can be there. We, we'd love to have you there. And uh, with that, you know, we're, we're, we're wrapped up here, but I do want to uh, say uh, a big thanks to, I think Barry had to run for another commitment. He was back there till just about a minute ago. Um, but he was helping behind the scenes with a lot of your requests to get added to, to mailing lists, to get added to the GitHub, to upload your, when you uploaded your presentations to the GitHub, he was getting them into Miteco so that uh, Benno could actually bring them up. Uh, the Miteco folks were working really hard because you know, it's, it's a lot of presentations all coming together at one time. That's not a typical thing for a Miteco session. And, uh, and I think it, it worked uh, relatively well. So, so thanks to everyone who helped make that happen. Also the secretariat and the NOC team have been helping us uh, tremendously throughout the whole day. So uh, thanks to everyone. Congratulations on a great event. And uh, I hope you have a, a fantastic IETF week.